The Morozzi bind is defined by white's pawns occupying e4 and c4. They provide space advantage while weakening the dark squares, especially d4. Since there is no possibility for a d5 pawn break, typically black wants to undermine white's center either with b5 or f5. Additionally, black has a variety of ways to create counterplay on the weakened dark squares in white's camp. On the other hand, white aims to utilize their space advantage to exert pressure across the board, on the king side with f4, f5, in the center with f4, e5, and finally on the queen side with b4, c5, all supported by the well-placed knight in the center. When it comes to the question of who benefits from simplifying the position and trading pieces, it is usually the one with less space, and in the Marozzi bind, it's obviously black. But it also depends on how the Marozzi pawn structure evolves during the middle game phase and which of those minor pieces remain on the board. For black, it is typically the best to keep one of the knights, which can easily use the dark squares and possibly establish an outpost in the center. This position on the board clearly demonstrates the knight's superiority over the light square bishop. Even if white's pawn structure slightly changes, but their pawns remain on the light squares. Of course, without black knight and white's terrible bishop, the situation drastically shifts in white's favor. Even without the presence of a backward pawn, Black is passive, waiting for White's e5 pawn break, as in the game played by Botvinnik and Toran. The central pawn break induces significant changes in the pawn structure, simply further weakening Black's position. One of the main features of Black's position is b5 pawn break, which is usually initiated by the move a6. It aims to remove the c4 pawn and regain some space and just a little beyond that. White has majority on the queen side, but this majority is not a good one. It's actually a minority attack in action. It means that this pawn of black is not a weakness, but a weapon. A weapon further to weaken white's camp. Firstly, the a2 pawn is a bit loose, especially if black advances to b4. And if a3 is played, black is going to advance b4 anyway, changing the structure, giving white the b2 weakness. And black is going to pile up everything against it. In practice, scenarios like this may occur. Feel free to pause the video and take some time to consider whether b5 is a good idea here. The truth is, the timing is perfect for the popular pawn break, because in the event of c takes b, a takes b, the knight cannot take due to the queen hanging on d2, and bishop takes b5 loses thanks to this little tactic, rook takes c3. So black gains significant amount of space on the queen side, the b5 pawn remains, and white's weakness on a2 is now exposed. Black can also seize space on the queen side by advancing a5, followed by a4. This secures a square for their knight, which maneuvers from f6 to d7 and then comfortably sits on c5. It also creates a potential target on b2. That's why we see black queen coming to b6, while the g7 bishop is already exerting pressure. And if the b2 pawn cannot move, then the c4 pawn lacks a supporter. Therefore, rook fc8 is a viable idea, and the queen often joins on b4, targeting the same pawn. That's why we can often see white advancing their pawn to b3 or b4, then black takes, and this new pawn structure occurs. Now, pay attention to the fact that the a file is open and for white to fight for it, they need a1 square, which is nicely controlled by our g7 bishop. So this a file is typically under control by one of the black rooks. Finally, the new structure brings another weakness for white, which is the b3 pawn. And 
black queen is again typically well placed on b4. Of course, this new structure is a perfect news for black c5 knight. And if white does not want that structure, they can fight, say, with the move a3. But it weakens even more. For instance, the c4 pawn remains weak as before, given the absence of b3. The b2 pawn does not improve either, and additional weakness created by this a3 move is the b3 square, which is ideal once again for the black c5 knight. Lastly, if white advances a4, it creates several weaknesses. The only difference is that the c4 pawn may feel secure, but b4 and c5 become outposts for black pieces. When it comes to the drawback of this plan, it does create a weak square on b5, but in most of the cases white cannot exploit it. Also, a potential weakness of the a5 idea is that it won't be able to go back to a6 and support the b7, b5 pawn break. Now, let's see how this idea works in practice. The position of the board is probably known to every Axire to Dragon player. Since a6 and b5 are not likely to work here, one of the best options for black is to advance a5 and a4. Typically white plays f3, freeing up their c3 knight, and then queen a5. The a4 pawn being in front of the queen means there is no trick in view of knight e5, which otherwise forces the queen back to d8. You can see that in case of queen takes d2, there is an in-between move knight takes e7 that wins a pawn. So, with a pawn on a4, the queen is perfectly safe. Now, say rook a b1, bishop e6, rook f c1, rook f c8. You can see that pressure is building against the c4 pawn. Therefore, white typically plays b4. We take and put the queen on b4, nicely blocking the b3 pawn. And now we are ready for maneuvering the knight to d7 and c5 or play a move like rook a3. The engine sees three zeros here, but I'd always take black in this position. Another interesting idea for black is possible if we haven't castled yet. That's to severely weaken white's pawn formation by trading our best minor piece, the dark square bishop, for a knight on c3, doubling the c pawns. If there is a way to immediately put pressure on white's queenside defect, it's definitely a sign that this is an opportunity not to miss. For example, in this position we can take on c3, attack the e4 pawn with knight c5, provoking f3, and continue to harass white's pawns with queen a5. Then we develop the bishop to e6 and play queen a4. The engine here suggests knight d4 for white allowing us to trade the queens, which obviously proves that the idea black conducted worked perfectly well. To some, this may look like a surprise, but there is an idea for black to play on the king side, popularized by the Soviet master Simagin. He showed that by advancing the f-pawn, black can remove one of the pillars of the Marozzi center, the white e4 pawn. For instance, if white defends with f3, it allows, first of all, f takes e4, producing an Isolani. Alternatively, I would say even better, black can advance to f4, gaining space and securing the e5 square for one of the knights. If white instead takes on f5, either black forms a central pawn majority, or recaptures with a piece and improves their piece play, including the opening of the f-file. Either way, black increases their potential on the king side and in the center. Now, the position on the board shows that white invested a lot in preventing b5. However, there is something off in the position of their pieces. So they are a bit too passive and focused, I would say, too much on the queen side. Therefore, black uses the other pawn break, f5. In this case, it is mainly related to the idea of establishing better coordination between black pieces. 
In the game that this position is taken from, rook f1 was played, then knight e5, queen e3, f takes e4, bishop takes e4, bishop h3, bishop g2, bishop takes g2, king took on g2, rook f3, queen e4, rook a f8, and it is obvious who is better. When black wants to exploit the fact that the majority of white pawns are on the light squares, there are some ideas of playing on the dark squares, and one of those is advancing g5. Now this move creates a possibility to install a knight or a bishop on the e5 square. In some cases it also supports an idea of placing a piece even on f4. Now in this position, for example, Black used that idea to cement their knight on e5. Of course, bishop takes d5 needs to be done first, then in the game we had a takes b3, and finally g5 is possible. Now notice that there is no minor piece that can be traded for this knight. If white were to try to use their f-pawn to attack it, they would first need to play g3, which is not that easy. Pointing towards white's weaknesses on the dark squares, black may even be interested in directly attacking the king by playing queen h4. The only condition here is to have the e-pawn moved to e6, which is not that often part of black's plan. Additionally, black should ensure that there is no immediate f4, which could push their bishop away from the e5 square. In this position, however, many underestimate these threats and play knight b5. Feel free to pause the video and find an attacking plan for black. I can tell you a bunch of GMs lost with the white because of the following combination. Queen h4, g3, bishop takes g3, pawn takes g3, queen takes g3 check, king h1 loses thanks to knight takes e4 followed by bishop takes e4, while king f1 is met by, well, the same knight takes e4. Point being, after f takes e, f5, and black's attack leads to minus 6, according to Stockfish. Now the most direct question arises, if white has created a hole on d4 with their e4 and c4, why should black not exploit it with the move e5? True, black creates a big hole of their own at d5 and makes their d-pawn horribly backward, but if they occupy d4 with their minor pieces, the d-file will be blocked. Also, this plan may work perfectly well if black has already traded their dark square bishop. For example, in this position, not only does this move take a firm grip over the d4 square, but black also uncovers their queen's defense of the important g5, which in many variations prevents queen d2 g5. Suppose white plays rook h3, black responds with h5, and we can see that their king is safe while the knight commands in the center. So the e5 pawn advance works well after the dark square bishops are gone. Surprisingly, throughout the whole Marozzi bind, black really hunts down white dark square bishop with the 1 on g7. Because without that bishop, white is practically losing even that little remaining level of control of the dark squares. And indeed, white should reject or run away from these trade offers. Now, in this position, for example, black moves their knight to d7 for a couple of reasons. And if white makes an inaccuracy by playing f3, a very common move in Marozzi bind, the move bishop d4 is by far the best. The dark squares become weakened, the knight gains an outpost, while the other one is coming to c5. Finally, here is the weirdest idea that I've ever seen in any opening. It is linked with the possible trade of the dark square bishops, but also has something in common with the Reti idea. 
only this time on the other side of the board. There are more than a thousand games in which this position has occurred, and it is a well-known position in the opening phase, where black offers to trade the dark square bishops, and white, as expected, rejects the offer. Then black puts the knight on c5 and may choose between two plans. One is already seen, consisting of playing on the king's side, including e6, bishop e5, possibly queen h4, or f5. But the other one is no less interesting. Black plays queen b6 to bring the f8 rook to c8 and then move the queen back to d8. Feel free again to pause the video and guess what black is trying to achieve with this. Meanwhile, the most played move for white is king h1. And black continues with h5. Typically, white responds with a3 and then king h7. Now you start to realize, I guess, that the queen is either going to f8 with an idea to insist on trading the dark square bishops via h6, or black is opting for queen h8 instead to increase control over the central diagonal. In any case, black's position is very dynamic. If you found this type of structure intriguing, you might be wondering how to enter the world of the Marozzi bind. Various openings can lead there, and I'll mention the most popular ones. Number one, Accelerated Dragon in the Sicilian defense, which initially sparked my curiosity about this pawn structure. Number two, the Moscow variation of the Sicilian involving moves like c4 and then d4. Number three, the English opening that often results in this structure if white chooses d4. Number four, white can also start the game with d4 and if black aims for the bank or Benoni and the first player declines to play d5, the Marozzi bind is likely to occur. Number five, in the King's Indian defense, if black seeks to transpose into the Benoni, but white refuses to play d5, it often resolves in transposing into the Marozzi bind structure. Number six, even black can be the one establishing the bind. In the English opening, when they play c5, knight f6, and d5, 